100% completed the entire Pokemon Scarlet Teal Mask DLC, beating every quest, catching every Pokemon to complete the Pokedex, and finding some incredible shinies. Here's what happened. Our journey starts with a phone call from Jacques. Yeah, that absentee homeroom teacher who you probably forgot about. Anyway, he invites us on a field trip to the mysterious land of Kitakami. So, armed with my team of powerful Paradox Pokemon and King Claw, we step into the academy where we meet this lady. And you know what they say, the bigger the hoop, the bigger the ho- Anyway, this is Miss Briar from the Blueberry Academy in Unova. She's not subtle about her obsession with terrestrialization and even shows us some extra hidden pages from the Scarlet Book. Next, we meet our travel companions, this fine looking roster of the most forgettable looking NPCs you've ever seen. And so, without even saying goodbye to our mother, we left for Kitakami. Once arriving at the bus stop, we're immediately free to explore the area. I instantly spot our first new Pokemon, ready to fill our Pokedex, and I killed it. Oops, not an ideal start, but regardless, there are a bunch of new Pokemon here, so I waste no time in catching as many as I can. What a weird looking whooper. Aren't you supposed to be brown? Quick, kill it! With a whole roster of new Pokemon and Claw. I evolved our new team members to give us a boost, but since I want to use only the new DLC Pokemon, sadly we have to get rid of Claw. But I found a perfect replacement in Corphish. This DLC has some awesome returning Pokemon, so let me know in the comments which one you're most excited for. After swapping out one Crustacean for another, we had a brand new DLC team and move onward to Masui Town where we meet Kieran and his older sister Carmine. And okay, am I the only one that can see Brock just chilling in the background with his Vulpix. Anyway, the siblings kindly welcome us to the town by calling me an outsider and not letting me into the town. Okay, cool. Guess I'll go home then. Carmine then forces us into our very first battle. I'm going to have some real good fun with you. Uh, I need an adult. But thankfully, her team is some hop tier garbage. Although we do get to see a new adorable Pokemon in Poltergeist. After my crab hammer isn't very effective against it, Carmine mocks me for not knowing type magic. Ups. What do you expect? I didn't even know this thing existed like one minute ago. Regardless, our Spider-Man poison jabs the Matcha Pot and we have no trouble crushing her final Pokemon into the dirt. And these siblings are just absolutely stunned by the beatdown that they just witnessed. <laughs> You must have been training your team for years. Uh, actually, I just caught these guys like 30 seconds ago. Embarrassed, the siblings flee, and then we meet this man called Caretaker? Wait, is that really your legal name? While exploring the city, I came across this Nurse Joy who's giving me some real attitude with that expression. Man, I miss when Nurse Joy was happy to see that all my Pokemon had died. Eventually, our trio of forgettable NPC pals roll up. We all gather together and are given our first quest of the field trip to pair up and find three signboards scattered across Kitakami to learn about their mysterious, legendary folktale. And to help us on this quest, we're given a powerful item of endless possibilities. A selfie stick. Gee, thanks Mr. Caretaker, you're too kind. Honestly, I don't even know the names of these three losers, so I pair up with Kieran for the quest. And so, we kindly introduce ourselves by utterly annihilating his two pathetic Pokemon with my new young Mega and stealing his allowance. But don't be fooled, Kieran's going to be taking plenty more L's by the time I'm done with him. Now it was time to begin our quest, but instead I got distracted by meeting my new wife. This is Perrin, a traveling photographer from Sinnoh and and the thief who stole my heart. However, she wants nothing to do with me, at least until we catch 150 Pokemon in the Kitakami Pokedex. So we'll deal with her demonic problems later. For now, we begin our search for the first signboard. And on the way, we're able to find a few more returning Pokemon like Snake Backwards, Bellsprout, and Eccentric, who I immediately add to the team and evolve it into Ferret. Truly the peak of Pokemon cuteness. Just look at those adorable little hands. For every one new subscriber we get, I will personally give Ferret one extra head pat. Do it for him. After taking a stroll through the apple fields and catching ourselves a delicious looking applin, we're also able to find Nose Pass in a raid. Fun fact, this is the Pokemon that Game Freak used as the inspiration when designing Opal from Sword and Shield. And spoiler, this guy is going to make an absolute fall out of me later on. Anyway, after catching our new nosy neighbor, we move up the hill to Loyalty Plaza, where we find our first signboard. It tells the interesting tale of a fearsome ogre who wore a mask and threatened to terrorize Kitakami. 
However, a trio of noble heroes were able to force the ogre back up the mountain. But tragically, the three heroes, now known as the Loyal Three, died in the process. <sighs> This is so sad, like if you cried. After taking a commemorative photo with Kieran, we show him our sparkly new bike. Wait, how is it a bike if it uses its legs? Shut up, kid. You're a year too late to be pointing that out. Just roll with it. Now we're bound for the second signpost, and on the way, we found something incredible. Polywag! And it's dead. How will I ever move past this and... Floating Poliwag! This time, I caught the tiny tadpole, and I mean, come on! Just look at how adorable this little guy is. The longer I stare into its eyes, the more my heart melts. My two brain cells got so distracted by Poliwag that I just got lost looking for cute Pokemon, and I was able to catch a bunch, like these nuts here, as well as Timber, Vulpix, and Spiner. But then, I stepped into the wrong neighborhood as I found this gang of Sandshrew, and I did not feel safe. So, I established my dominance by kidnapping their big daddy Sandslash and putting it on our team. After evolving a bunch of the Pokemon we just caught and adding them to our roster, we pushed onwards to Kitakami Hill. Everyone here is working really hard to set up for the festival. Yep, everyone is working really hard. Near the temple here, we find our second signboard. This one expands on the tail a little, stating that the ogre had four masks, with each giving the ogre a different type when worn. But the loyal three were able to wrestle away three of these in their battle, greatly weakening the ogre's power. And for some reason, Kieran is in love with the ogre that terrorized his village. Wait, what? Regardless, we take a photo with the Shrek-obsessed weirdo, and now that we're aware of how terrifying that monster is, naturally, we decide to go and show up on its doorstep. Yep, makes perfect sense to me. So we charge up the mountain towards the ogre's den, and oh my god, that Pichu is going to drown! Somebody help him! Rip, this is so sad. Please subscribe to pay your respects to the poor fallen Pichu. After rudely interrupting this meeting of the Swine Up Council, we climbed up the mountain before eventually reaching the ogre's den. After handing Kieran another freshly baked fat L, this man turns into a YouTube React thumbnail. Anyway, we enter the ogre's lovely home and Kieran just flat out insults the abode before inviting the ogre over for a sleepover. You really are one weird dude. The sun starts to set, so Kieran invites us to check out the mask festival which started today. After his grandma lends me some fresh festival clothes which I will absolutely not be giving back, Carmine forces us into a rematch. However, this one is pretty straightforward, with our DLC team gradually wearing down her Pokemon. With one final hydro pump from our one pump man, we secure a quick win. While on our way to the festival, we run into Jacques, who invites us to a romantic, candlelit picnic with just the two of us and a gulpin. For some some reason. As creepy as this whole situation is, he does give us a mysterious Pokemon egg. I was so curious to see what was inside, so I started running around like a maniac and actually found a bunch of new Pokemon to help fill out my Pokedex, including Gligar, which is one of my favorites. Also, I don't know who asked for these two to be added back into the game, but if that's you, I'm happy for you, but please seek help immediately. And look, I love our bike Pokemon. It may not be as cool as a plane or a tank, but I can pilot those by playing our sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder's the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. You can pilot over 2,000 vehicles in thrilling, highly immersive PvP battles spanning across land, sea, and sky. Each vehicle has an incredible level of detail in the design, right down to the specific components. The vehicles in War Thunder span over 100 years of development, and you can even customize them with a huge range of camo and other materials. But my favorite wild customization is the cultured 3D anime body pillows. Just imagine this is what your enemies will see in their dying moments. This could be you. So click my link in the description to unlock your own body pillows in game as part of a huge welcome pack, which also includes premium vehicles, account boosters, and lots more. So start playing War Thunder right now for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. I continued wandering, eventually finding this stand which sells syrup apples. And remember that Applin I caught? Well, this item is the key to evolving Applin into the brand new Pokemon, Diplin. It may just be an apple that's been impaled by a sharp green stick, but it's adorable, so I'm adding it to our roster. And the new Pokemon just keep on coming, as straight after that, I stumbled upon this little Poltergeist. I am a certified matcha addict, so this little guy is going right onto the roster. With two new Pokemon secured, our DLC team was starting to form. And after more running, our mysterious egg finally hatched into... 
Dirtwig, the adorable Sinnoh starter that I was not expecting at all. So, having added a few new pages to our Pokedex, we then made our way to Kitakami Hall to see the festival. Oh my god, she's eating a poor innocent Diplin! You monster! After exploring the festival for a while and taking part in a strange berry collecting minigame, we see this little guy just strutting on in. Carmine and I approach the strange Pokemon, but it flees, dropping its mask in the process. And okay, this thing is just straight up adorable. I will defend you with my life. Turns out that this is the big scary ogre? Yeah, I don't really see much of a resemblance either. Regardless, we keep our ogre encounter a secret from Kieran, mainly because he's weird and will probably try to marry it. Oh, I get it. You were making fun of me behind my back. Uh, no, I've actually been making fun of you directly to your face this entire time, weirdo. After that, we finished up at the festival and head home. The candy fruits of the mask festival had such an interesting flavor. That's because you were eating a Pokemon, you sick freak. The next morning, we talk about our mysterious ogre encounter with Carmine's grandpa. Go on, show grandpa what we got yesterday. Oh, right, my roto stick. Not the damn stick, the other thing. Oh, right, right, the mask. After showing him the teal mask, grandpa reveals a shocking twist. The Kitagami legend that we've been reading isn't true. The ogre is actually named Ogapon, a Pokemon who arrived in Kitagami long ago. It had a travel companion, but the duo weren't accepted into the village. Although, by using masks, they could blend in and join the festival. However, their masks were so nice that three greedy Pokemon raided their home. By the time the ogre returned home, there was no sign of its travel companion, and all it had left was one teal mask, the mask that we now have. Ogapon sought revenge on the three greedy Pokemon, but the townspeople thought that this was an attack on the village, instead believing that the three greedy Pokemon were heroes trying to defend the village. Grandpa just dropped a bombshell. We promised to keep the truth a secret, but that weirdo Kieran has some 99 stealth stat as he just eavesdropped our entire conversation. Anyway, we leave the teal mask with Grandpa for it to be repaired while we meet up with Kieran. Hey, what were you and my sis talking about? Oh, we were just laughing about how weird you are. Now we're bound for our third and final signboard, and this one is a trek located all the way at the top of the map. It's a really long journey, but on the way, we're able to catch a bunch of new Pokemon, including this adorable Hungry Hungry Munchlax. After also catching Lotad, one of my favorite Pokemon, I was able to find this Razor Fang in a cave, which I immediately slap onto our Gligar. Now I just have to wait for it to be nighttime to get a Gliscor, which surely won't be long now, right? However, the best thing I found on this journey was this unremarkable teacup, as it's this item that allows our Poltergeist to evolve into this glorious Sinistra. It's so cute, and look at its little udders. Yep, those are definitely udders, and I will not be told otherwise. After finally finding the third signboard, Kieran decides he hasn't had enough of being slapped around and asks us for another battle. And I just really want to point out how Sinistra spins around while attacking. What an absolute king. Anyway, after my Diplin demonstration, that it has the superior drip, my glorified apple on a stick also crushes Kieran's final Poliwrath with no trouble. We annihilated this man so badly that he even hits the angry Arthur pose. After the fight, we read the final signboard. It states that if the ogre sees your bare face, your soul is gone. <laughs> yeah, imagine being dumb enough to let the ogre see your bare face. Kieran's still upset about being weak and about us lying to him, so after taking a very depressing photo together, he heads back to the village. We've got to do the same, but I decided to take the long way home, doing a bunch more exploring while also searching for some new Pokemon. And I found a bunch of cool ones like this awesome Steel Terra Hakamo'o. After catching it, I added it to the team and instantly evolved it into this incredible pseudo, Kamo'o. And at this point, I got really distracted, spending ages exploring in the northern area of the map while also filling out a bunch of extra pages in my Pokedex. Most of these Pokemon were pretty basic, however, I did find this cool Terra Ice Dusclops. And after that, I found one of my favorite Pokemon ever, this slumbering Snorlax. Some things never really change. Call me a Gen 1-er, but I absolutely adore this giant oaf and immediately added it to the roster. So after having spent way too long catching Pokemon, we finally returned to the village to rest. Good morning, friend. Uh, who are you again? I'm from your school. We sit next to each other. Oh, right. Forgettable NPC number one. I remember you now. After meeting with Carmine, we're told that to repair the teal mask, we'll need to collect some crystals from the crystal pool. 
So, after a huge climb up this mountain in the middle of Kitakami, we find this beautiful lake area at the summit. Here we can find the crystal pool, but before we can collect the materials, we're ambushed by a Milotic. Although, thankfully, our new Komo'o is a beast, as Carmine and I quickly take care of the glorified sea snake. After the fight, we collect the crystals that we need to repair the teal mask before being ambushed again, this time by Briar. You know, the person who's supposed to be looking after us, yet we've barely seen this entire time. Carmine basically tells Briar and her oversized hoops that she doesn't belong in such a sacred site. God, I love the sass levels here. Anyway, we learn that Briar is investigating the water here, as apparently the crystal pool emits an energy similar to that of terrestrialization. Although Carmine has zero interest whatsoever and immediately leaves the lobby. On my way back to the village, I found this cool looking cave and... Ah! While I did almost die, we did find a cleffer down here, so it was all worth it. But there was also this mysterious masked trainer standing here, so I decided to battle and oh my god, level 75? What did I just stumble into? While our Komo'o can barely outlast her Heracross, next she responds with a Komo'o of her own. And this thing is a demon, because that stupid fighting dragon then proceeded to utterly destroy my team sweeping through literally every single one of my Pokemon one after another. We just got clapped. And by a random trainer? Who even are you? Clearly, this DLC wasn't all going to be smooth sailing, as we were handed a giant shiny L. And the L's just keep on coming, as now we find out that Kieran stole the teal mask? I'm gonna kill that kid, but we'll deal with him later. For now, my wife is waiting. All that catching I did earlier means that our Kitakami Pokedex now has over 150 entries. And this is the trigger for our quest with Perrin. But first, we have to take her on in a battle. She has a Leafy on, and this is giving me some real deja vu, but I can't quite figure out why. Come on, Leafy on, let's take the ultimate shot. <laughs> Pathetic. Now it's my turn. After Komo'o bodies her entire roster, Perrin asks for our help in finding the Blood Moon Beast, Ursa Luna. It sounds scary, but surely it can't be that bad, right? Oh dear god, what have I gotten myself into? So, we meet up with Perrin in the Timeless Forest, but I'm not sure I want to go through with this. Once you're good, we can set up in the tent and wait for a foggy night. In the tent? Together? Okay, never mind, I'm back on board. The first part of this quest has us survey the area, taking photos of nearby Pokemon, kind of like a Pokemon Snap minigame, which is really cute. Once our survey is complete, we're eventually able to track down Ursa Luna, and oh my god, it's even more horrifying in person. Perrin uses her camera, which just ends up acting like a flashbang, enraging the giant bear. We have to battle the Blood Moon Bear in a boss fight, and yeah, this is definitely tapping into some deep-seated PTSD from Legends Arceus. But this fight shouldn't be too bad. I mean, we have Komo'o who can... Oh god, we are totally screwed. After it utterly annihilates my Komo'o with Blood Moon, things turn from bad to worse, as now the bear starts boosting its stats with Calm Mind. Facing down a boosted, bloodthirsty Blood Moon bear, my team was absolutely no match. My beloved Pokemon are getting slaughtered. I am fighting for my life out here, and Perrin is just taking photos. Help me! Despite my pleading, help did not arrive, and my entire team was crushed. Yet, another loss. This bear has danger written all over its face, so this time I needed to bring my A game. It was time to get cheesy. Equipped with a new devilish plan, we once again stepped up to Ursa Luna. This time, I lead with Dusclops and instantly afflict Ursa Luna with Curse. I thought this would be GG, but the curse damage doesn't increase like it should. This is terrible, and I'm at DEFCON 1 as our Dusclops goes down. As is tradition, the bear starts boosting, and I start missing attacks. Although, I do eventually hit Ursa Luna with Stun Spore before beginning to slowly chip away with Sinistra. However, our tiny teacup soon falls, and my nine-tailed fox that follows dies instantly. We needed a hero. We need Snorlax. After landing a Screech, our lovable Oaf does fall to a single Blood Moon at the hands of Ursa Luna. However, this defense drop is crucial, as it means that Komo'o can come on in and hit a super effective close combat for enormous damage. One more of these on the next turn finally slays the giant bear, giving us the win on our second try. With Ursa Luna defeated, we're clear to catch it with a very based Premier Ball, and I grace this deadly Blood Moon bear with a very fitting nickname, 
Sailor Moon. You okay, partner? Yeah, no thanks to you. With that, we'd completed Perrin's Blood Moon quest and she rewards us with a choice scarf as well as giving us a Hisuian Growlithe who I immediately evolved with a Firestone into this awesome looking Arcanine. Now that our team had some huge upgrades, it was time to make that thief kid pay. All right, Ursa Luna, kill. Kieran confronts us, saying that he knows that we lied about the ogre. He starts having a heated gamer moment before challenging us in a battle for the teal mask. He seems confident, but that confidence goes out the window once my big bear sends his Yanega to the Shadow Realm with Blood Moon. And things get even worse for Kieran once my Snorlax turns his Gligar into a pancake with Giga Impact. Ultimately, his team just can't keep up, with Komo'o finishing the fight, handing this man yet another giant L. After that loss, he He's molding so hard that he punches a rock. Kieran returns the teal mask before rage quitting like the salty gamer that he is. However, then the monument to the loyal three literally explodes, revealing that the trio had been resurrected. They flee, and we chase the trio all the way to Kitakami Hall, but we're too late as they've already stolen the three masks again and powered up with some roided up mochi. We continue chasing the trio until reaching the ogre's den, where Ogre Pond is down, and it looks like these three are trying to finish the job. Side note, I would find this whole situation situation much more concerning if these guys didn't have the goofiest names imaginable. Anyway, Monkey Dory tries to step up to Ursa Luna, but our Blood Moon Bear quickly puts that monkey back in its cage. And once our backup arrives, the trio of cowards flee, and Kieran apologizes for stealing the mask. Good. Now are you done being a salty brat? No, not even close. Kieran tries to return the mask to the ogre, but gets flat out rejected. My poor man here cannot even get one single W. After seeing Ogre Pond gladly accept the mask, Mask from us, this marks the beginning of Kieran's salty X arc. Now Ogapon follows us around and look how cute it is. Anyway, the next section of the DLC requires us to retrieve the three missing masks. This involves chasing down each of the three thieves and taking them on in battle. My god. There he is, Onkus Donculus, in all his five frames per second glory. Each of these are boss battles, but we get to team up with Carmine, which makes this entire process way smoother than our last boss battle. See, Perrin, this is what helping looks like. In no time at all, we slay all three members of the greedy trio, securing the remaining masks. After the final boss fight, Kieran pleads with us to bring Ogapon into the village. They tried to kill it last time, so I don't blame it for not wanting any part in that. Regardless, it has Presidently follows us into the village, where the townspeople, now having learned the truth from Kieran, apologize for mistreating the ogre all this time. With the conflict resolved, we take Ogre Pond back to its home in the mountains. However, through the power of friendship, Ogre Pond decides that instead, it wants to travel with us. And my god, does this make Kieran seethe? I thought this man was going to explode in this moment. Kieran is in full salty X mode, trying to convince Ogre Pond to choose him. She doesn't like you, little bro. Move on. Regardless, Kieran demands one final battle, like we haven't already slapped this man into the dirt 19 times. And folks, I will admit, I have taken some L's in this run, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna lose to Kieran. Things do look very scary once his Polyrath gets off a belly drum to maximize its attack, but thankfully, our good boy Arcanine can shut down that punching frog with an extreme speed. And from here, his team is pretty strong, but we gradually wear it down without any more trouble. After Arcanine buries his Diplon, we hand Kieran one final L as this man falls to his knees in Walmart and begins eating the dirt. With the crying X now out of the picture, this clears us to finally take on Ogre Pond. But this battle is not easy as we have to take it on in a four stage boss fight. That is insane and each stage has it wearing a different mask, granting Ogre Pond a different type. However, our roster of DLC Pokemon is incredibly diverse and powerful. Arcanine quickly crushes the fire phase with rock slides, and Apple on Stick handles the water phase with energy ball. While the rock phase does cause some problems, as we lose multiple Pokemon, thankfully, our ace Komo'o can get the job done with close combat, before also outlasting Ogre Pond's final phase. With that, the Ogre was defeated, and we finally added Ogre Pond to the roster. This development sends Kieran into an existential crisis as he runs off in tears for one final time. I want you to show me Ogre Pond's power in one final battle. 
After also bonking Carmine's team into submission, we're called back to the village where Briar announces that her, Carmine, and Kieran all have to return to Blueberry Academy immediately, foreshadowing some issues with the Great Crater. Carmine delivers a heartfelt goodbye and invites us to visit Blueberry Academy in Universe sometime, while her salty little brother has absolutely lost his mind and vows for revenge. And that concludes the main story of the Teal Mask DLC. However, we weren't done yet, as to 100% percent the DLC, we still need to catch the Loyal 3, as well as complete the Pokedex. Thankfully, I've been catching a bunch of Pokemon as I explore, which means we've already gotten 170 out of the 200 Pokemon needed to complete the Pokedex. There are some really tricky Pokemon still to get, but to start, I took all the Pokemon out of my PC and just evolved as many as I possibly could. And this gave me a stack of new pages in the Pokedex, as well as giving us some of my favorite Pokemon ever, like Gliscor and Ludicolo. After this festival of evolution was over, we'd already jumped up to 183 Pokemon Core. But here we encounter a problem. See, a lot of the Pokemon remaining evolve via trade, which makes things difficult. However, then I found this, a Politoed Raid Den. And after catching this lovely friend-shaped frog, I started to hunt down as many Raid Dens as possible. And this took a really long time. But sure enough, eventually I started finding some other trade evolutions, including Golem, Dusknaw, Milotic, and Conkledur. After catching a few other missing pieces, I had to start getting creative. See, by taking out cute little Cleffa and shoving 200 berries down its throat, we birth ourselves a Clefairy. And then, by force feeding that a Moonstone, we get our very own Clefable. Next, I made this abomination of a sandwich, which I served at a candlelit romantic picnic for our Ditto and Milotic. Then, nature takes its course, yielding us this egg, which hatches into a Feebas that only a mother could love. Next, after our Basculin commits genocide on the local Slugma population, eventually it hits itself hard enough with its own recoil that it finally grows up into this mighty Bascule Legion. That brings our Pokedex to 193 Pokemon caught, with only these seven targets remaining. I'll deal with these cowards later, but these four were giving me such a hard time. I spent ages looking for them, but just had no luck at all. And this is where I realized I am an idiot. See, Apom and Morpex are actually Violet exclusives. Basically, I've been looking for Pokemon that don't even exist in my game. So to get these, I had to trade my Scarlet exclusives online, which I was able to do no problem. And after evolving Apom into Ambipom, then we were left with only Nosepass. See, I thought Nosepass evolved by leveling up in a specific location. So being the idiot that I am, I've been stuffing his fat face with candy all across the map, only to realize that he actually just evolves with a Thunderstone. Anyway, after that tiny brain moment, our nose pass finally evolves into Opal the Probo Pass, and with that, only the Loyal Three remain. But before that, there are some important side quests that I quickly need to take care of. First, by trading, we can obtain the other two Sinnoh starters, which we can then evolve to give us the entire Sinnoh set. Now, remember that masked trainer who embarrassed us earlier? Well, I made sure to go and get my revenge by utterly annihilating their team now that we had some more powerful Pokemon. Don't you dare make me look stupid in my own video ever again. Next, I wanted to find a shiny Pokemon. And while I did find this sparkling little puffball, it's not quite what I had in mind. So instead, I made another very delicious looking sandwich, then went hunting. And this took such a long time. I was really starting to regret it, but then I finally found a shiny Gligar. I quickly caught it and evolved our sparkly new Scorpion into Gliscor. This is honestly one of my favorite shinies ever. With that, there are just two more side quests that I need to take care of. And the first of these involves this scummy little scammer. I'm a 10 year old on a field trip and he has the audacity to ask me for a million dollars? Are you kidding me? Anyway, after selling Nimona on the dark web, I empty out my wallet and swipe mum's credit card. But surely there's an incredible reward for such generosity, right? Nope, for a million dollars, all we get are some clothes. I feel like a victim, albeit a well-dressed victim. Our final side quest of the DLC is is here, the Ogre Alston minigame. Basically, you have to collect a number of 
of berries and return them to these crates. But there's a timer, and your berries can be eaten by wild Pokemon. And no joke, finishing this on hard difficulty is probably the hardest thing in the entire game. Even with a stack of four players, we still couldn't beat it. And on this attempt, it was right down to the wire. We just needed one more berry with two seconds left, and... We just clutched up, winning with no time left on the clock. It took me way too long to beat this, but our reward makes it all worth it because we get a shiny Munchlax. This is incredible. And after stuffing its face with a four core serving of berries, we now have an awesome shiny Snorlax. And with all the side quests completed, now all that was left to do was to hunt down the loyal three. First, we have to find them, but it turns out that they've just returned to the locations where we battled them previously. So first up is Monkey Dory, who we were actually able to catch pretty quickly, all things considered. But this guy is an absolute pest. I have no idea why, but but Okie Dokie just refused to stay in the ball. This whole fight was very not Okie Dokie. After the toxic Incineroar clone had crushed most of my team and wasted 30 minutes of my life, eventually we caught the stupid monkey. And last is Pheasantipity, who is equally annoying since it can recover HP with Roost. However, after yet another painful slog, it too gives in. And now we had caught every member of the Loyal Three, as well as completed the entire Kitakami Pokedex, made official by this awesome diploma. With that, we had 100% completed the Pokemon Scarlet Teal Mask DLC. Jump into this video next for more Pokemon content, and subscribe for more cute Urit content. Also, remember to download War Thunder for free on Xbox, PlayStation, or PC, and use my link in the description to get your hands on all these amazing welcome pack bonuses.